Welcome to another edition of RCE. This is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. There's all the old episodes there, an RSS feed, uh, where you can find everything about all of us. Uh, I have again here Jeff Squires, one of the authors of OpenMPI from Cisco Systems. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Sure, Brock. Yeah, today uh, we're doing something uh, on the education venue, which I think is awesome because it, it directly relates to our field. But it's also about bringing new people to the field and bringing them up and all these kinds of things. So give us a little explanation of this. Yeah, so today we're going to have a guest talk to us about something I, I believe is pronounced Shodor. He will correct this for me, but uh, it, it's an organization that appears to be focused on education more. So, uh, Bob, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself and then give us an overview of what Shodor is. Okay. Uh, my name is Bob Panoff. I'm one of the founders and the executive director of the Shodor Education Foundation, or simply called Shodor. Um, I used to be a physics professor, and one of the things that I developed with my colleagues in math and computer science was an interdisciplinary approach to research and teaching, uh, which everyone calls computational science these days, but wasn't so much so 25 years ago. Uh, in the course of developing what we wanted to do in the classroom and in the computational laboratory, we found that the training of faculty through workshops was a very important piece, and that's something that we have focused on, and it was really the reason Shodor came into existence. Uh, greetings. I'm uh, the uh, Director of Education Not Reach Activities for the NSF-funded Exceed project as well as for the NSF-funded uh, Blue Waters Project. And I spend my time at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. So when you say training of faculty in, in education, you're not talking about training faculty in computational science. You're talking about training faculty in the education of things they probably already know. Well, it's a little bit of both. Uh, because in the United States, there is only one profession in which the individuals practicing that profession get absolutely no training in the conduct of what they're doing, and that is college professor. Uh, so if someone is going to be teaching with modeling and simulation, they perhaps have never seen that as a method, even though they may be modeling and simulating all the day long. But to teach with models and simulations as content and method is something that's, that's new to most faculty. But in many cases... We've also had to teach faculty about modeling and simulation because it's not necessarily native to their own experiences, especially in uh, biological sciences, uh, in the social sciences. We find a lot of people say they went into biology because they love science but didn't want to have to do any math. And so we often have to introduce them to the power of modeling, simulation, interactive visualization and then help them bring that into the classroom as well. So uh, we're overloading some terms here. And so what I want to know is what you just described, you're actually talking about encouraging teaching with the use of some of these computational resources that the rest of us tend to use for our research, and we actually focus on computation. But you're talking about they're just another tool for teaching possibly anything. Right. And it's not just another tool because it's, also, the content of what's being taught, that people need to know that what we're learning in astronomy is not just by looking in telescopes, that what we do with models of galaxies and colliding galaxies is much more the practice of the everyday computational uh, scientist than simply analyzing data. So it's an important part. What we like to kid about is the breathing mode. We're interested in both computational... <sighs> science education, which is using computational models and simulations and the analysis of data to teach the content of physics, chemistry, biology, the social sciences. But we also teach computational science, which is how to build the model, how to construct the model, how to test the model, how to be sure that you know that you're not only solving the right problem, but that you're solving the problem right. So we talk about computational science education and also computational science education. And Schroeder's engaged and has been for 20 years now in the practice of both. 
Now, how did you come to recognize this as, as a problem that, that needed to be solved? Or put differently, how did this all get started? Well, in the old days, I was a physics professor, and I was also the director of education at NCSA. And there was an opportunity through discussions with the National Science Foundation that we could be running a substantial number of workshops that the National Science Foundation would be willing to pay for. Unfortunately, um, the organizations that I had worked for at the university and center level uh, did not necessarily want to take on a grant in which the bulk of the funding was participant costs. And, and the simple reason is there's no overhead. Um, it would cost more than we would be bringing in, they said, for us to run these workshops. And so Shodor really was created to have an independent, nonprofit, 501c3, whatever jargon you want to use, uh, approach to doing faculty enhancement for helping faculty to be better at what they do and how they do it without necessarily um, distracting a university or the supercomputing centers um, from their concern about the bottom line and the actual cost of the grant. So Schoeder was really this, this new idea of being an independent player so that by day, most of us who ended up working at Schoeder would be professors at universities, but on our own time, we would run these workshops for other faculty. Um, then I had a wonderful opportunity in, in fall of 1994, 20 years ago this fall, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer, and they gave me a, uh, a look at the life expectancy versus size of tumor data, which was a scatter plot that went to zero at 10 centimeters. And since my tumor was 21 centimeters um, of necessity, um, they gave me an opportunity to think about what did I want to do for the next six months. And the answer was... Let's work on getting Shodor up and running, and uh, I can always come back and be a physics professor later. So you mentioned that uh, you know the university professor is the only you know profession where you're not actually trained to teach, but you're expected to. But primary, secondary education, that is the case, but we definitely don't see these sorts of tools being used there. Does Shodor work in that space? Um, secondary education? Yes, we do, but we also do it primarily through changing the experience of the undergraduate student and their professors. Uh, people ultimately teach the way they were taught, not the way they were taught how to teach. So, by example, if someone was in a chemistry class and they never saw computational chemistry and they were only lectured to, but they had a science teaching methods class in the School of Education, they recommended using models and simulations. When that high school teacher gets into their own classroom, she's probably going to be lecturing to her students because that's how she learned chemistry. Um, and so where we're seeing more of this happening is when we take these workshops that are funded by NSF through Exceed or through other grants, uh, when we bring these faculty together and they change the undergraduate experience, then the students in those classes are going to either be future graduate students and perhaps future professors themselves, and many of them are going to be future middle school, elementary, or high school teachers. So, um, depending upon how those things are going, you know, we can make that effect. So, we do have direct workshops for middle school and high school teachers. We have workshops for the faculty who teach the content of math and science at the undergraduate level. We have not been as successful, and in some ways it, it hasn't hurt us because of what I said uh, in working with as many schools of education as we had hoped. But it's really that introductory course as a freshman or sophomore when you see biology or chemistry or physics for the first time and you see how to learn it and explore it, if, if dynamic models are part of that experience of learning, it will become part of the experience in their teaching. Okay, now, what you just said there reflects my own experience in education. I never saw simulation or modeling in, uh, until college. Um, what do you 
have middle school teachers show in terms of dynamic models and 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 at, well uh, more generally you know at at every level what kind of uh, teaching style do you encourage for the content matter that is presented say at a fifth grade sixth grade seventh grade all the way up through uh, the collegiate level right so we 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 sort of do the high chair to rocking chair womb to tomb approach to education so. Many of our materials are used by teachers to teach kids as young as third grade. Um, we're also entrusted by the Blue Waters Project and the National Science Foundation to run the Petascale Education Program. Um, a, a little fun thing we like to do is to have people go to Google and type in the words arithmetic quiz or type in the two words Petascale Education. And in each case, what you're going to run into is that Shodor has been working at all of these levels to make the learning of science and the practice of science more dynamic. So, for instance, with little kids, we have models that will let them see a predator-prey problem in the, in the context of wolves eating rabbits and rabbits eating grass and everybody hopping around or moving around. And the dynamic agent model is something which is producing a visual model of what's happening in the ecology. At the same time, there are graphs and data that are generated in the model that can be looked at in a math class. Uh, there are opportunities for them to propose computational experiments and to change parameters and to vary things and to make conjectures. So the idea of, of making the classroom an inquiry-based approach in which the fundamentals of the scientific process really come down to expectation, observation, and reflection. And what the computational world brings to the learning of science and the learning of math is the ability of seeing the effects of one's expectations, directly observing those effects, and then giving an opportunity to reflect on them. So we have everything from spread of disease, predator-prey, collision of molecules, collision of galaxies, right? So here are two different end-body problems, which we, of course, would not necessarily use that language with a third grader or a seventh grader, but the idea is that there are many things happening in the world that involve collisions, and some of them are at the sub-nuclear level, and some of them are at the galactic level. And we can understand both of them at different scales through modeling and through simulation. So you're talking about teaching, you know, using these tools, teaching a subject that's already being taught. But there's been a big push in the last couple of years with things like Code.org and other things that are more focused on the tools that would be used to make new of these models at an earlier age. Do you guys work with them, or do you see them as having a different goal than what you have? Well, part of their goal is, as I understand it, and I am not intimately working with them, is that they're looking at programmers from the standpoint of using people to teach programming. And a lot of what they do is they have a, an idea of what you can program and how you can program it. What we are using is sort of what you might call middleware which is modeling software. So we don't write the code that's inside of Excel, but we use Excel to build a dynamic visual interactive model. We don't write the code that generates agent models, but there are people who have generated those models, like agent sheets, in which at a very high level, in a very descriptive level, you can create a model from a description of the behaviors so if I wrote a sentence that said, if a healthy person is next to a sick person, there is a chance the healthy person changes into a sick person. I've just written code, but only if I'm using the modeling software that can interpret my sentence and make it this dynamic interactive experience. At the coding level, we agree that some people are going to need to know coding, and the earlier they learn it, the better. But we find many more people will learn coding if you actually give them these intermediate tools first. So system models or agent models or numerical models, that, that it's the model building software that we use to great success. And then those students who see that and ultimately push the limits of that software come back and say, well, how would I go beyond this? And the answer is, well, if you knew some programming, you could do that. So rather than starting out everybody with hello world or simple things or teaching loops or teaching abstracts, we want to start teaching science using computational methods. And the best approach that we have found is this realm and wealth of tools that are, are modeling and model building tools rather than 
assuming that it's going to be programming. That being said, even when we teach programming, we teach programming with working models. So we give students an existing Java or JavaScript or Fortran or C model that's completely built, running, and works. And then the students learn to modify that model and to tweak it and to see, if I change this, what happens? If I change this, what happens? What we don't want to do is teach keyboarding skills. I mean, <laughs> in my experience, a lot of programming classes is learning how to type. Right? And what we would rather do is, is learn how to explore and to conjecture and to observe and to model. And certainly part of that, I think we've learned to talking with many people, is that this approach is more interesting to girls, young women, who want to get into modeling visualization as well. And it's, a number of the minorities tell us. We work with a lot of Hispanic and African American students here who don't necessarily have the background or have computers at home, but they very quickly get into this dynamic and visual modeling environment, and then they, they, get, they get excited about it. It's something that, they, that we can see a higher retention across the board. Now, you mentioned a couple of technologies in there, so Java, JavaScript, Fortran, and, and so on. Uh, you, you kind of beat me to the punch uh, on the question. I was going to ask, what software do you use and do you have uh, you know, different levels of software that you use or different types of software and modeling tools that you use at the different levels of education? Yes. So at the, And I'm not going to talk so much about grade level but knowledge level. So at the novice level, and that novice could be a middle school student or their teacher. It could be a graduate or a postdoc. But at the novice level, we have models that work, that run. And the student learns to run the model and learn the science by varying parameters, by making observations, by thinking deeply about what the output of the model gives you. Um, and I would say that it, for professionally in some fields, um, that's exactly how the profession works. I know very few chemists who on a daily basis write code, but they run Gaussian. Now, that's not necessarily true with some of the other sciences, but there's a lot of science to be done by running models that have already been built, running code that's already been built. And what your job is, is to define the problem and interpret the results. So we have lots of Java applets, JavaScript applets. Our website gets 4 million web views, not just hits, but web views a month, where people are spreading diseases and, and propagating rabbits and they're looking in the ecology or they're studying the variation in code, of right function. not not in reality well, yeah. <laughs> they're not spreading diseases actually right <laughs> <laughs> right but but you know what i mean it's it's they're getting their hands on the real subject area by seeing what happens under certain conditions so that's been a really fun part of what we do we can provide materials to people and they can use them for learning and At actually next, that I mean, that's actually the key part of simulation and modeling, to do things you can't do in the real world, either because it's too small, too big, too dangerous, or, right, infectious. Right. So, so that's one part. Now, the next thing we do is we use a set of modeling environments, and I'll include Excel as one of them. Uh, we use, for agent modeling, we use both uh, uh, something funded by NSF called Agent Sheets. We also use NetLogo. Uh, and, and the bulk of those models and also another environment that does system modeling, uh, which is called Vensim, the bulk of those things are we give students and their teachers models that have been built in these environments, but because we're giving them in the environment in which they were built, they can not just change a parameter, they can actually modify the model. They can add effects that weren't in there to begin with, they can change effects, they can make it much more complex. And, and so they learn the modeling process by taking the ancient theorem of modeling, which is that the right answer is the wrong answer plus corrections, right? So you start with a simple model. It's not really the way the world works. It may not even be close, but you can make it better. And so these modeling environments that allow you to look at things in, in the context of iterative processes is something that's really powerful and gets students. And, and Shodor has not only created a lot of these materials, but we have collected materials from the students and the faculty that we've taught, and we've vetted them 
and, and make them available through what's called the Computational Science Education Reference Desk. It's part of the National Science Digital Library. We've also, uh, at the higher end, at the level of Petascale, we have assisted faculty in developing complete teaching modules on topics from atoms to galaxies in which students can access code that runs on computers a million times faster than their own Mac or PC, the so-called petascale machines, and, and see that science on a very large scale. Right? So, but the approach we're taking is um, creating models that already work, are ready to run, and the learning is achieved by changing parameters in those models up to modifying the models themselves, and then ultimately we promote a fairly good percentage, but not nearly everyone because they don't need to, uh, to become becoming the programmers who build those modeling environments in the first place. So I want to take a little bit of a different route here. Um, thinking more about secondary education, do you actually go into schools themselves? It sounds like a lot of what you described is come play with something on our website or come to some workshop, which is in addition to your normal learning. Um, secondary ed is a harder thing to kind of break into and get them to change their ways. Have you had any success there? Yes, and we've done it, as I said, first and foremost by changing the undergraduate experience and having teachers go into the classroom and bring our materials with them. A second is that we work in a train-the-trainer model where we're working with a number of state um, institutions from North Carolina to Texas to Oregon. Uh, we've even gone up to Alaska in which we work with the people who work with teachers and show them better ways of using the technologies that are being brought to the classroom. Um, our biggest success historically has been with the schools that are on American military bases overseas. Uh, starting in the late 90s, uh, Congress mandated that every child in every American school on every American military base overseas would spend at least an hour a week on a computer. And the teacher said, doing what? Because they had no curriculum. They had no software. And so Shodor took about, uh, starting in the late 90s and going all the way through today, we have developed a set of materials called Interactivate. It's available from Shodor at no cost. It runs on any device, mobile or otherwise, and it produces this set of materials. And then we work with teachers to incorporate that. Uh, Shodor has the co-teaching model where when we train the trainers, we recommend that those trainers themselves work with teachers in their own classrooms and not just have sort of a remote, you know, impersonal workshop. So that's a big part. The other part that we're doing, if I can sort of change it a little bit, is we do a lot of workshops with middle school and high school students ourselves here at our office in Durham, North Carolina. So we have hundreds of kids in the summer will come through week-long workshops in which they'll learn. Um, it's not the name of the workshop. The name of the workshop is Modeling Your World, for instance. But what they're really learning is um, computational biology and computational physics or computational chemistry. But they're learning it at a topic in a way that they can see the excitement. And then those kids bring what they've learned back to their classrooms, and then we hear from their teachers saying, hey, how can you help me do this same type of thing? We have an entire apprenticeship program teaching high school students the range of skills from modeling and simulation, web design and graphics, programming, including parallel programming, system administration and databases, and through a program that is very time intensive. These high school kids put in three full Saturdays a month plus eight weeks in the summer working a 40-hour week. And we are producing students who are capable of building the models that we ourselves use and produce and make available to people. So at the end of the day, we not only have the number one simple graphing tool on the Internet, we have kids who know how to build it. I mean, again, this could be a little homework exercise for the listener. Go to Google and type in the two words, simple plot, P-L-O-T. And what you're going to see is a really, really well-built, simple-to-use graphing tool that is so much easier to use at all kinds of levels than pulling up Excel if all you want to do is build a graph. 
Right. And that was built by high school kids here in North Carolina. Right. So we, we, we see a great success in getting kids to be building things that other people can use and success in getting other people to use those. Okay, so at the secondary level and primary level, most states have defined material that schools are required to cover every year. Have you gone to, like, actually the state level at individual states and been like, here's modules that map exactly to the material you're supposed to be presenting? Yes, we have gone to the states, and they've come to us. So, for instance, in all of our online materials in Interactivate, every activity and every lesson plan is indexed to the Common Core standards and to individual state standards that have an accepted Common Core. At the same time, the individual states who have discovered our materials are building databases of recommended materials that support their own individual state standards. So if you were to go to the Texas um, Education Association, the TEA, and look for their standards, Texas has actually aligned all of our materials to their standards because they support what they're trying to teach. If you went to a website called NYLearns, Dot org. That's the New York Regents. They have a complete alignment of all of the Shodor materials according to the standards based. Um, Learn NC is the North Carolina Standards Organization, and they have taken all of our materials and aligned them to the individual state standards as well. So we've done the alignments, and if you were to go to Shodor.org and click on Interactivate, you could click on a button that actually says Standards, and you could look for individual state standards. Or you could look for the Common Core or what are sometimes called the NCTM or the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. So it goes both ways. So you've mentioned a couple times that you have some, some free tools. How are, how are you funded? How do you uh, – what are your costs and how do you keep this education rolling? Good. So our initial funding was in fact from the National Science Foundation to run workshops. When that – workshop grant, which was a very small grant at the beginning because I had been um, ill at the, at the actual foundational stage of Shodor. So, Shodor. so the NSF gave us a little bit of money to do a few workshops. When those were evaluated to be highly successful, they expanded it substantially and gave us not only money for running additional workshops, but for developing the content that was needed as faculty came back to us and said, yes, what you showed us was nice, but here's what I need. And so the National Science Foundation has funded probably 80% of Shodor over the course of time, either directly through grants to Shodor or through sub-awards from various institutions, uh, from NCSA and the University of Illinois primarily. So that's, that's a bulk of our funding. We also get funding from individual organizations. Cisco uh, awarded us with something where they said we were the grand technology winner uh, in, I think, 2008. And with that came money for us to develop curriculum that could be shared with other people. Uh, private foundations have given us curricular money. Intel has given us curricular money. Uh, and so we, we go out and we try to get the money to build the stuff that we know teachers need. At the student level, we have gotten funding to develop workshops. But once we run them on an everyday, all summer basis, we actually charge a fee using the theory that those who can pay should, and we use that money to pay for the kids to attend the workshops who can't pay by giving them scholarships. So most of the money has been federally funded, but um, a, about 20% has come from private foundations or from corporations who want to support what we're doing and how we're doing it. Now, what about those of us who would be interested in maybe – um, working one of these workshops or something like that on a volunteer basis, uh, how, is, is that available or do you actually have professional staff to make sure you have continuity across different workshops? Uh, a little of both. We do have a certification process where if people want to teach in the workshops, we invite them to come attend the workshop and perhaps uh, come back and, and be a co-teacher in the workshop and a volunteer and helper. Uh, the vast majority of our workshops are in fact not taught by Shodor staff, but they're taught by faculty who have themselves taken the workshops, have used this in their own classrooms, and can speak in the first person as to the effectiveness of using the approach of modeling with students. 
Um, so if people can get in touch with us, um, we are doing a lot of work with Exceed. The workshops that are funded through Exceed allow opportunities. Uh, we have cited some of the workshops at Exceed provider locations and using their staff to help teach particular topics. Um, we have been we we hold the Petascale Institute through Blue Waters um, at NCSA and leverage their staff to help teach what we're doing and how we're doing it. They know some of the things on running Blue Waters certainly a lot better than we do, um, although we have been learning ourselves alongside it as it came along. So, Scott, this is a perfect tie-in for you here. I wonder if you can tell us what your perspective of Shodor is and how do you partner with them and, and things like that. I've been working with Bob since uh, the late 1980s when I uh, started with NCSA and he came to uh, – be a part of a summer workshop that we had for students. And Bob was the kind of guy that came in and not only engaged and excited the students, but also the rest of the staff. And, and Bob and I have been working together uh, since then in various capacities. Uh, Bob brings tremendous energy to these workshops. And it's from the perspective of not only how he engages the students, but other faculty. And a critical part of this is, and he hasn't really explained it yet, but how he works with others to change how they teach these kinds of topics and subjects. To stop doing PowerPoint slides, to stop lecturing, but actually engage the participants so that they're active participants in the learning process. And, and, and this has really uh, been demonstrated repeatedly in, in the kinds of workshops, the kind of uh, presentations that Bob gives all over the country and, and we've just built on that energy and that excitement and the knowledgeable people that he brings together to really make the kinds of workshops that we think are critical to changing the curriculum at all levels so whether it be K-12, undergraduate, graduate um, it brings tremendous ideas and approaches that I think are really effective and it's been demonstrated in the changes we've seen in the curriculum in both the K-12 schools and particularly the undergraduate courses. I mean, we've, we have evidence from various surveys talking with faculty that we're seeing significant change occurring as a result of this kind of engagement with the community. It's really amazing. So that kind of begs the question, how do you typically start an engagement? Does somebody come to you? Do you go seek out an organization or a need or, you know, how does somebody find you or connect up with Shodor one way or another? Um, it, a lot of it is uh, viral um, expansion where we have people who've seen things and have been successful and then they show it to their colleagues and then they want to be trained or they want to have the same experience. Um, we are very mobile in the sense that we bring the workshops out ar across the country. Uh, we've been, uh, we've had faculty from more than a thousand institutions over the last 10 years attend our workshops. Uh, we've done 240 some odd workshops around the country, occasionally coming back to the same place more than once. But the, the engagement is at multiple levels. So we may be the invited talk or the keynote at a, at a regional workshop from the Consortium for Computing Sciences in Colleges, the CCSC organization, or we may be at an ACM conference, or we may be at supercomputing. And when people in sort of the plenary see the kinds of things that we do, and, you know, I, you know somebody said I put on a good show, uh, you know, it's an engaging talk that people say, gee, how could I do that in my own classroom? Then they find out about some of the training opportunities, or they go online, we have some, you know, self-guided tutorials at Shodor so that you don't necessarily have to wait till you go to a workshop, but you could. Uh, you could go through that material online. Um, and then we do a lot of work with Exceed and with the individual centers uh, to be trying to engage their outreach efforts uh, to, to bring, you know, the, the simulation across the curriculum. I, I would agree. There's a lot of word of mouth of... Uh, either people having heard Bob or some of his colleagues present and just uh, people telling one another about the value of this. And then the other critical aspect is in working with these teachers and these faculty, the materials they develop 
we then put back into these repositories to share with the broader community. And it's the ability to pick up what others have done, relate it to what they're trying to do in their own classroom, either using these modules as they are or, or modifying them so they're appropriate for what they're trying to do in their own classroom. So it's really been a, a tremendous effort to uh, engage the community. So uh, what exactly does the name Shodor come from? Okay, so uh, that's an interesting way to answer uh, or to ask that question. The name comes from the following story. When I was a physics professor at Clemson University, a young man needed me to sign a form, but he could not remember my name, so he didn't know what office to look up in the directory. So we went to the department secretary and said, you've got to help me. I need to get this form signed. I can't remember my professor's name. The only thing I can tell you is that he's short and kind of dorky looking. And, uh, <laughs> and if you take the first three letters of each of the big words, um, in 1994, when we were starting Shodor, uh, we were sitting in the lawyer's office, and the lawyer said, what are you going to call this? And one of my board members from Clemson said, why don't we call it the Short and Dorky Foundation? And I said, we'll never get away with that. But I had been in the Navy. Steve had been in the Army. Dan had been a Navy SEAL. And the common experience is you take the first three letters of each of the big words and you make up your own name. So that's where the name came from. It came from the fact that I happened to be short and kind of dorky looking. Now, why did we use the name? We used the name because, if you remember, we were starting Shodor so that we could run workshops even if there wasn't any overhead. That we were not concerned about overhead to decide what would be the appropriate use of our time. And if helping other people was a good thing to do, we had to find a way to do it, even if the university structure or the supercomputing center structure couldn't handle that level of outreach. So the lawyer said to us, you can't just pick a name, we have to make sure it's not derogatory or misleading. And when he looked it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, the word Shodor is the name of the hammer, and it's the process of turning gold into gold leaf, that you have to beat on it and beat on it and beat on it. And if you do that, the gold will go a lot farther. Whatever it covers is more attractive. It's less electrically resistive. It makes it better. And it doesn't have to be a lot, but it has to be gold. You can't use tin. You can't use paper or dirt. And our goal for Shodor was to take the best approaches for teaching math and science and beat on them and beat on them and beat on them until we could get them to spread out. And even if it's kind of thin, it'll go a long way. And what's the point at the end of the day if all the gold sticks to the hammer? So we thought this was a linguistic miracle, and we said, we've got to go with this name. And, and that's where the Shodor Education Foundation name came from and why we use it. Well, that's curiously appropriate. But, uh, but, that's actually but, pretty cool. But what I wanted to add is that Bob <coughs> loves to tell this story when he uh, first meets with a group. And that ability to, to say that and laugh uh, really engages the community. And, and that's what begins the, the, the very vibrant uh, interchange between Bob and every audience that he speaks with. I mean, that, that kind of humor, that kind of engagement uh, really builds camaraderie between the participants and, and Bob as a, a leader of a session. Yeah, I mean, we don't take ourselves too seriously, but we have a lot of fun. We do a lot of good work. The materials are being used by lots of people. And it doesn't bother us if nobody actually knows that it's us. Like I said, if you go to Google and type in the words rabbits and wolves, you're going to find our materials. If you type in epidemic disease model, you're going to run into our materials. You know, we're not first. We're Wikipedia's first, then Harvard, then us. Okay, But, I mean, lots of things that you would want to teach dynamically, uh, it turns out that the materials that our students here in Durham at the high school and college level that have been trained by us, that have worked very hard and put in a lot of hours, those materials are now being used by millions of people around the world and primarily in this country, but around the world, uh, to engage the process of learning through running and interpreting models. 
So you you halfway answered my next question. There was I was going to say where, how do people find you on the web and and uh, start an engagement and things like that. But uh, while you were talking there, I googled rabbits and wolves and simple plot, and sure enough, the first Google hit takes me straight to showdoor.org. Um, where should you go on the Shodor website to say, you know, I would like to get some kind of formal engagement rather than just use the tools? I want to actually be trained in all these kinds of things. Right. So the, the Shodor website is laid out in such a way that there are tabs, there are indicators that people should be able to see themselves. So there's a tab for students, there's a tab for educators, there's a tab for parents. There's a tab if you're just looking for activities and lessons. And so when you come to showdoor.org, you should be able in one or two clicks to see where we are able to help you in some particular way. Right? And so there, there are those efforts to make it an engaging web experience that you can quickly find yourself uh, and see yourself working with Shodor because you know we've anticipated you looking for us on the web. And we've used that same approach with a project that we do in collaboration with Scott and Exceed, which is called HPC University, that if you go to HPC University, we've organized the, the resources that if you're a student, there's a place that you can easily see, oh, that's the portal for students, or that's the portal for educators. Right? And so there's opportunities for us to do the same thing. Uh, so a lot of self-discovery um, is there, and, and it takes a little bit of effort, but what we've tried to do is to use good graphics design and good web interaction to help people more easily find us if they happen to land on our on any one of the pages at any one of the levels. There, there are guiding signposts that tell you how to get to the other stuff. Okay, uh, Bob and Scott, thank you very much for your time. Uh, talk to you soon. Okay. Anything you. else we can help, let, let us know. 